Please turn there with me, and I'm going to have you turn to a couple more scriptures, so don't, don't um, uh, close your Bibles. Uh, keep it open. We'll start in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, then go back to Romans 14. If you want to get both those verses this morning, I want to get right into the scripture. While you're turning there, let me say again, uh, uh, everyone who can would like to help us get these kids something for Christmas, let me know. Uh, we're going to have um, a big day on the 23rd, and we need to know that before the 16th. Try and raise $1,300 more and get them all a $10 gift, 150 kids at least. And then we've got some other stuff we want to do too. Maybe help some of them that would like to go to camp who can't otherwise. So if you can help us with that uh, little Christmas project, I don't know anywhere does this size that does more for kids than this church you're sitting in. Uh, and I mean that. So uh, let's take advantage of the ministry that God's given us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll start there this morning. And then I want you to get Romans 14 back. I want to do something very important here today. Please give me your undivided attention for a few minutes this morning. You're going to learn some things. And then you will also be challenged. And that's what should happen at church. I want to say I enjoyed that song, Brother Jason. Uh, we go out there in the world, you go in the store, you hear rock and roll. You go in the, in, the, in, the, in the mall, you hear rock and roll. You go in the convenience store, you hear rock and roll and rap and everything. It sure is good to not have to hear that when you come to church. Isn't it a blessing to come to church and not have to hear rock and roll? Some people don't have that privilege. Thank the Lord for it. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we... Christians, the pronoun we is found a bunch in this chapter, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Back to Romans chapter number um, 14. Romans chapter number 14. There's only two places in the Bible this phrase appears, the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, and look at verse number 10. Romans 14, 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why? Dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Keep your Bibles open. I'm going to have you read another one in a minute. And I want to preach on that subject this morning. The judgment seat of Christ. Every Christian here today, listen up. This is your future. This is peculiar. This, the doctrine of the judgment seat of Christ to the writings of the Apostle Paul. A special dispensation of grace was given to him, and he wrote to the church, the body of Christ. That's why you'll not find this phrase in the Old Testament, nor in, in the, the, the Gospels. It's a phrase that is to the Christians, the church, the bride of Christ. Many of the new Bibles, modern versions, don't even have this word, phrase in it, judgment seat of Christ. One I got here, as we studied on Wednesday night, said, uh, I believe it's this one, maybe. Um, so it said, we shall all stand before the tribunal of God. No, 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 no. Uh, we are standing before the judgment seat of Christ. If you study your Bible, you understand that there are at least seven great judgments in the Bible. First was the judgment of our sins on the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Second, our own self-judgment as we judge ourselves so that we would not be condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31. The third is the judgment seat of Christ. This one here, where all Christians stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. The fourth is the judgment of the nations, how they treated the nation of Israel. Matthew chapter 25. The fifth is the, is the judgment of Israel itself. Ezekiel chapter 20 and during the great tribulation. The sixth is the judgment of angels. Angels will be judged, and we'll even partake in part of that judgment. 
And then seventh is the great white throne judgment. That would be the judgment when sinners of all ages stand before God to be condemned for the lake of fire. This judgment here is called the Bema by educated preachers who want to impress you that they know a Greek word. But it means the judgment seat of Christ. We'll divide it up into four parts. This is your future. Listen up. Number one, what is this judgment? This is a judgment that is only for Christian. When every one of us stands and gives an account of our life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Most people live today like there's never going to come a day when they'll have to answer for anything. The pronoun we, as I said, is mentioned in that chapter 26 times. That one and 1 Corinthians 3 that we'll look at in just a minute. Now, we are given account of our works of what sort, not size, sort they are. So this is a judgment when we're all going to stand in front of the Lord He's going to take all of our works and throw them in a fire and we'll try them of what sort they are. There is a big debate and preachers have knocked down, drag out internet fights over the accounting of sins, our sins, at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I have a hard time believing that God would wash something away and forgive you and it's under the blood and gone forever and then him bring it up to you. I have a very hard time with that. I can't believe that. So judicially, judicially, all of a Christian's sins are forgiven, forgotten, past, present, and future. However, on the other hand, uh, I also can't believe you can just live like the devil as a child of God with no accounting for it whatsoever. There's got to be some reckoning up somehow. That's why that verse said, though in the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So God's got it figured out exactly how he's going to do that. i tell you four things there's going to be at this judgment. This is just in the, in the what is the judgment. There'll be broken hearts when we realize what a mess we've made and what God has given us. There'll be bloody hands where we fail to witness to our friends and neighbors and give them the gospel. There'll be burned works where we fooled around and didn't do as God would have us to do. And then there'll be beautiful rewards as we'll see in just a moment. Number two, where is this judgment going to take place? Somewhere beyond when the Lord comes back. If the Lord come back, he'll call us up to himself and he'll have a judgment scene set somewhere yonder in the heaven. It is not here on earth. The Lord does not come back to this earth until he comes to rule and reign for a 1,000 year honeymoon with his bride, which is the church. The location is somewhere there. It is not on the earth. We are getting ready for the wedding, as any bride does, getting the wrinkles ironed out of our wedding garment before we're presented without fault or, or wrinkle to our husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, when is this judgment? When will this happen? During the, all, the great last type of the th tri tribulation period or during that time of tribulation before the advent of of the Lord Jesus Christ. You gotta understand, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment are two completely separate events. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it is not to determine whether you're going to heaven or hell. People who believe in one general resurrection and one general judgment believe and teach that. I, I used to think that growing up. I didn't know. I thought that one of these days the Lord's going to come back and just blow everything up and you're going to stand in on his scales and he's going to put all the bad things you've done on one side and all the good things you've done on the other side and whichever one of them outweigh, uh, that would be which way you'd go. And the average person today believes that. That is absolute. You couldn't get further from the truth if you tried hard, stayed up all night. This is not a judgment to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. 
Now, I will tell you something. You should already know this. Your determined future is made before you leave this world. While you're still on earth, that's fixed, heaven or hell. You don't get on the other side over there and change plans and change your mind and say, well, now, Lord, uh, and, and I'll tell you something else. If he puts all your good works over here and all your bad ones over here, you're in trouble, buddy. Everybody is. I mean, you're in a mess for sure. Hey, we, we are saved. Our destination is already fixed. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you're born of him again, part of the body of Christ, he becomes your Savior, then you are a part of his body. You say, well, what's he going to judge us for? Our works, our works of what sort they are. Yeah, you know, I've heard people say, man, i tell you what, I, I, ain't, I ain't worried about it, buddy, when I see the Lord. Listen, this is going to be the scariest thing you've ever went through in your life. We're not scared we're going to hell, but is anybody here happy to meet the Lord this morning and stand right in front of God and everybody in a big court uh, and, and with your life as it is? No, no, I dread it. I dread it. I dread it. That's why the Bible said there'll, there'll be tears. There'll be, God will wipe away tears uh, from their eyes. There will definitely be broken hearts. There will definitely be bloody hands. There'll be Christians who will stand in shame. I'm not ashamed. Yeah, you will be too. I heard about this guy. Uh, he come in one day and he come down to this farmer and he worked for the, uh, he worked for the, the state uh, uh, drug enforcement. Yeah, the D, DEA. And he, he come out and he said, uh, well, there's some people growing some pot out here somewhere. And he said, I'm going to find it. And he said, I come to check over all the property. And the farmer told him, he said, that's fine, sir. That's absolutely fine. You're more than welcome to check my property. He said, but there's this one field right over there. Now, don't you go in that field. You cannot go in that one field. You're not allowed in there. Please don't go in there. He said, really? He said, buddy, you ain't telling me where I can go check. He pulled out that badge. He said, you see that right there? That's the Department of Drug Enforcement Law Officer. I can go wherever I want to. You can't stop me. Nobody can stop me. I go where, where nobody can stop me from getting in. He said, okay. He went out there, buddy. It wasn't but a few minutes, so they heard him a screaming and a running, coming to trying to climb a barbed wire fence, and there's a bull about that high after him, about ready to kill him. Help me, help me, help me. And the farmer said, why don't you show him your badge? That's where all these big tough people are. That's where all these big tough guys are. You know, well, when I, see, I heard one guy, there's a guy over in Iceland one time told us, he said, when I see the Lord on the throne, I'm going to go up there and grab him and choke him. Yeah, we'll see about that, buddy. i tell you what you'll do. I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll fall down and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what I'll say. When he calls my name, Danny Castle, stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. You got saved when you was 18. What have you done? I'll hang my head and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he'll take my works and throw them in a fire. Here we go. Number four, this is where I'm going to spend my time. Ladies and gentlemen, why is this judgment? The reason for this judgment is to determine what and why you did what you did. Of what sort? I'll say three things about it. And then some other, a bunch of other things. First, you'll be judged fairly. You'll be judged fairly. Now, sometimes if your family's got a lot of money, you can buy off a lawyer or a judge and get crook and hook your way out about anything here in this world. Not here. You'll not buy this judge off. He will judge fairly. Reality is going to set in on you. You're going to realize uh, 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 he's going to judge you fair. I mean, uh, the Lord will take everything into consideration. He's a fair judge. He'll take into consideration how you was raised. He will take into consideration how your parents treated you. If you were ever abused, if you were ever, uh, that things that contributed to the mess you got in when you got bigger. In other words, he's a, he's a fair judge. Let me put it like this. I heard a man say it like this. It makes a lot of sense. He don't just measure how far you got. He measures the obstacles you overcome in getting there. Some people had it a little easier than other people. And God takes all that into consideration. 
If you was born into a Christian family and raised right all your life, you should be a lot further down the road than somebody who never had those privileges. God will judge us fairly. And then I want to say uh, the battles you fought, the battles you won, the barriers you overcame. In other words, a lot of times we'll look at somebody and say, boy, she don't come to church regular, does she? I go to church every Sunday. But you've got a husband that gets up and gets ready and pays the bills and gets you there, and she's got one that cusses her and threatens her with her life if she goes to church. So all this stuff's going to come out one day when God settles a score. You'll be surprised for sure, no doubt about it. He'll judge individually. The Bible said each one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You will answer for you. I will answer for me. I'm not going to answer for my kids. They're not going to answer for me. Every one of us will stand before God as an individual, and you will be judged. That's why the Bible said, judge nothing before the time. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, till the Lord come. And he'll bring the light, the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then shall every man, I love that part, have praise of God. By the time this thing's over, the Lord's going to pat us all on the back and say, come on, let's enjoy eternity. Thank the Lord for that. Now, our works this morning will be revealed by fire, and that will be your entire Christian life. This falls into six categories. Let's read about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Get your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is your future. You better learn this. This is where you're headed if you're a Christian. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I will now show you exactly what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. He's got all your life on record. He's got your, your the Bible said your works Good and bad. I, I don't know how he's going to do that sin thing. Maybe if he was living like the devil, uh, you have to give an account of it. I don't know. But I know if your sins are all forgiven and forgotten, they're gone and he won't mention them. I know that too. I don't know how he's got all that worked out. But I'll tell you this, how much we know. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Look at it. So here we go. I'm going to read you how the judgment is going to go. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, that's Paul, I have laid the foundation. He laid the foundation of this thing. He is the minister, his ministry to the Gentiles. He was the minister to the, the church, and he laid the foundation, and another built it thereon. But let every man take heed how he built it thereon. That, watch out how you live your life. Verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, there's six materials. If you're going to build this building, you got two by sixes, you got carpet, you got wood, you got shingles or metal, you got electrical wires. Here's what your life is six things. Look at it gold, silver, precious stone. That's the first three. Wood, hay, stubble. That's the second three. Three of them will go through fire and three of them won't. Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. When he comes back, his eyes are like a flame of fire. And it said, the fire shall try every man's work of what sort, not size, sort, it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, for on he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, if you messed around and wasted your life, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, when it says you're saved by fire, it don't mean to say that fire saves you. It's a Bible way of saying through fire. Like Noah was saved by water. It wasn't through, it, it wasn't, the water didn't save him. He was saved by it right through that water. That's what it means by fire. Now, let's divide this up. You have six materials. Everything you do from, from the time you get saved falls into the category of gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. 
If I had a, 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 a chunk of gold here this morning and a chunk of silver and then some rubies and diamonds and emeralds and pearls and then I had a piece of wood, some hay and stubble here this morning and I set a big old fire and I threw it all in there. When the fire's gone, the wood's gone, the hay's gone, the stubble's gone, the gold is made pure, the silver is purified and that will stand. Whatever goes through that fire, God is gonna give you a reward for it. Now, please don't sit there and be like some of these people say, Brother Danny, I'm not interested in no rewards. I know. Listen, you are now and you will be then. You'll want something to lay at his feet. You will desire. You'll wish you'd have done better. You'd have tried more. All right, first of all, let's take gold. What would be gold? These are my thoughts, so uh, I'll give it to you best I can with the scripture. First Peter chapter one and verse seven, the Bible said the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried by fire. Uh, listen, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the, the, the gold would represent a person who went through a tremendous trial and even gave their life for the Lord and, per, and, and endured the persecution, especially what we would call the martyrs. The martyrs definitely fall under the category of gold. I hate to tell you, but there ain't a whole lot of American Christians going to have a lot of gold to lay at his feet. I, I hate to bust your bubble this morning, but uh, brother, it rains outside and we don't go to church. Somebody laughs at us at work and we quit witnessing. I mean, Lord, we're a pitiful lot uh, to say the least. But ladies and gentlemen, those martyrs from Stephen, the first martyr, right on to the Apostle Paul, who had his head cut off. All the disciples except one died a martyr's death, and that was John. And he died of old age on the Isle of Patmos. The Lord took him up or something. But all of them beside John gave their life for their testimony. A martyr is somebody who seals their testimony with their own blood. There have been a minimum of 50 million martyrs People that died for their faith just in the dark ages. And I want to say this morning, there's still thousands, yea, millions of people all over the world that are still in other countries this morning giving their life for the faith they have in Jesus Christ. And one day, that'll come forth as gold that they'll have to live with forever and ever and ever. I'll read you about one. There's many, John Huss, the martyr. I'm gonna read you about a young lady, only 24 years old. Her name was Anne Askew, 1546. The young lady was a Baptist and a Christian that loved the Lord with all of her heart. She suffered at the hand of Henry VIII on her way to London and the police arrested her because she rejected the Catholic mass and would not submit to the authority of Rome. They called her a gospeler, a female gospeler, because she went around praying, 24, you hear me girls? 24, you hear me ladies? 24 years old, they put her in prison. They said, we'll kill you if you don't tell us where all the Christians are. She said, I'll never tell you. So they put her on the rack. They stretched her. The rack was something You've seen him in old Frankenstein movies where he had a bunch of wood and a bunch of wheels and these cranks and they'd have a person with leather or chains tie them to that rack and they'd tie their arms up like this and their feet down like that and they'd crank that thing and it'd stretch you. And you could hear their bones popping, their shoulders popping out of joint and they'd scream while they were on the rack and they pulled her and pulled her and her body was broken. They beat them with whips. They starved them to death. They poured melted lead in their ears. They cut off their limbs an arm at a time or their tongue. They put out their eyes. These people let them jerk their arms off. Our generation would rather watch football than go to church. I don't want to be mean, but listen, I'm being nice to what it's going to be at the judgment one day. When we stand before the Lord one day, they told her 
They questioned her. They were amazed by her knowledge of transubstantiation. You don't know what transubstantiation is? That means the Catholic Church believes that when the priest pronounces the blessing on the Mass, it literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ, becomes God. We don't believe that. We believe it's just bread and juice representing his body and his blood. They, they, they said, you don't believe that? And that young lady looked back at them and said, I've read in the Bible where God made man, but I've never read in the Bible where man could make God. 24 years old. They said, you've got to go to Mass. She said, I'd rather read five lines of my Bible than go to five Masses. Amen. She spent her last hours writing so she would not recant and that she would not recant and deny the Lord. She said, Lord, I have more enemies now than the hairs on my head. Let, don't let them overcome me, Lord, for on thee I cast all my care. They tried to get her to deny the Lord. She said, I'd rather die than denounce my faith. They had to carry her. They're going to burn her to death. And they had to carry her in a chair because she couldn't walk. They pulled her bones out of sockets. And they carried her in a chair to the stake and put the chains around her and set her on fire. She burned to death and a large crowd gathered around for that young lady, 24 years of age. They asked her, you want to deny him? She said, I did not come here to deny my Lord and Master. They scattered gunpowder on her body to make it pop and burn quicker. The fire got underneath her. Incredible example. She had no idea I'd be telling this in the year 2018. And I'll tell you a story of a girl. But that girl going to come forth as gold. That's gold. Everything you've suffered for the Lord, and you did it for Him, not for a show, not to be seen, but you did it and you put up with it for His glory. It's gold. Then there's a the second thing, and that's silver. Silver. What silver? I read in my Bible in Psalm 12 and verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace, purified seven times in a furnace of fire. I would assume that silver would relate to how we treated our Bibles, how we believed our Bibles, how we preached our Bibles, how we loved our Bibles, the amount of time we spent in our Bible. I get up here and fuss every year. Read your Bible through, read your Bible through, read your Bible through. In three weeks, we'll stand up here, say the one that done it. I finished way back in October in the New Testament three times and my Old Testament once. Hallelujah. But that's not, these people back then, they lived in the Word of God. How have you treated your Bible? You learn it, you love it, and you live it. It's a final authority in all matters of faith and practice. When you go out of here today, do you throw your Bible up in the back glass and then next Sunday morning say, honey, where's my Bible? I hope and pray you don't treat the precious word. There's people died so mean you could have this here this morning. Are you listening? I mean, there's some churches where people don't even bring Bibles no more. They're too cool. They're too hip. I mean, those hip churches where you don't even use the Bible no more. Brother, there ain't nothing in this world. You know what's got me through the troubles I've been through? I love good singing, but it ain't singing. I love good music, but it ain't good. You know what's got me where I am today? That, that blessed old book right there. That's been my strength. That's been my help. That's been my guide. When I have to make decisions, I say, I ain't smart enough, Lord. I'm going to go by what that book says. And brother, one of these days, there'll be silver thrown the fire of how we treated our Bible. Not to mention the tracks. I thought about every time you go witnessing, Every time. Grab you some of them tracks out there. You want some silver? Grab you a handful of them tracks on the way out and just leave them. If you're too chicken to give them to somebody, leave them on the table when you go out to eat unless you're scared to do that. Can you do this? How you doing, sir? Can I give you something to read when you get time? Are you scared to do that? I ain't scared. Well, why won't you do it then? Yeah, I ain't never seen grown men scared of a little girl waitress four foot tall. 
afraid to give her a track, afraid she might say no or something. Put it out! Put it out! You know why I got bumper stickers on on my car? I want brother to put the word of God out. I've left, I've left tracks from here to, to San Francisco, to New York City, to Miami, Florida. I put them everywhere I go. And I, I'm not boasting. I'm just saying, brother, I believe in putting out that book, putting the Word of God out, that's silver. Put it out, put it out, put it out, put it out, put it out all over the place. Now, all it could represent gold too, but I'm just saying, in, in my thinking this morning, put out the Word of God, print tracks, don't ever quit. Be faithful to church, serve God, do the right thing. Have something to live his feet one of these days and then there's precious stones number three what was precious stone in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 17 the Lord said be in that day when I make up my jewels the Bible said they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever it could be souls souls people the bus kids the bus people the drunk on the street the man on the side of the road the missionaries that we support Every time a missionary comes in this church, you give him one dollar. If he goes to Africa and wins one person to the Lord, you're laying up treasure where moth can't corrupt, where thieves can't break through and steal. All your money you leave down here, your kids are gonna fight over it. And everybody gonna fight. But everything you, everything you send it on ahead, brother, when you're investing for God's work, help out somebody here and there, help out somebody, get on one of them buses. You men ought to be st- Standing in line, want well, to say, I want to drive a bus. I want to drive a bus. I want to have some silver. I want to have some precious stone. Really, I'm not just saying that. I'm telling you, people, listen. What he's going to throw it in the fire one day? Are you are you uh, 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 sitting in the coffee shop at 11 o'clock and come in here? You have to cut a toothpick in your eyes to open them. Or you get up and doing something for God and come to church, prayed up, and already read your Bible, serving the Lord, got a handful of tracts, and ready to put the Word of God out. Precious stone. Amen. Cup of cold water. The Lord said, you wouldn't lose your reward. There's a young lady in this church that does this every Sunday. I'm not going to tell her name because I want her to get a big reward when she gets to heaven. See, if people brag on you down here a lot, you don't ask about all the reward you're going to get. But if you do it not to be seen of men. You know, the thing I know about this, the Lord knows your heart. Last night, I was praying as I always do on Saturday night, and I was up in the top closet praying, had the door shut, and I was on my face, and I was praying, oh God, and I've been texting Brother Mike about the bus, and, and uh, I talked to um, Mr. Cook about the bus, and he said, make sure the bus has got fuel in it, and I texted him, said, make sure the bus has got fuel in it, make sure the bus has got fuel in it, and I had that on my mind, and I was, and I was up there, and I was praying, and I was praying, and I was saying, oh Lord, oh Lord, please, Lord, please, God, give us a good service tomorrow. Lord, just fill the church with fuel tomorrow. And I stopped. And the devil said, you stupid, you're just wasting your time. And I said, well, you know what I meant, Lord. Fill the, I, don't fill the church with fuel, no. But see, you know what God does? God looks down and hears me say, fill the church with fuel and sees my heart. And then he looks and sees the big shot deacon said, our gracious heavenly Father, we come to you this beautiful Sabbath morning and go, that's, that's stubble. That's going to burn, ain't it, Brantley? Amen. That's right. He's with me. I'm telling you, brother, listen, he tries it. What's sordid? God, ain't you glad God knows your heart? Hey, if you don't do nothing but get up here and sing in this choir and do it from your heart, you'll be rewarded one day. Hallelujah. Lord in mercy, think about that. And then, right quickly, I've got a long way to go now. Hope you ain't in a hurry. Number four is the wood. Now, the wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up. Wood is, is a good thing. It's right here is wood. You can make stuff out of wood. It's okay, but it'll burn. It'll burn. So what would wood represent? Being a good citizen, being helping out in the community, belonging to civic groups, uh, we're helping your neighbor out maybe just doing, you know, uh, but it all stays here and burns up. If you're in the civic club or, a, or you're in a do-gooder club to clean up the trash in the community and you belong to the moose and the goose and the lions and the sheep and the, and the buzzards and gee and, and everything and you, and you do good, help, help the people in, in other communities and do that, that's wood. I mean, it's okay, but it'll all burn up. It's not spiritual. And then what is hay? 
Everybody knows what hay is. It's not completely useless, but it'll burn quick. I would put, this is my, I'm doing this. I would put uh, under the view of hay, uh, sports, bodily exercise. The Bible said bodily exercise profiteth little. I mean, it's okay. You can eat it and all that, but it ain't going to really amount to nothing. Do you know what it's going to matter? How many games your favorite team wins this year when the judgment seat of Christ? It ain't going to mean one flip, brother. All that will be thrown in the fire. Even exercise, and I think you should exercise, and I do. Maybe I do too much. I don't know, but I, I try to, and I tell you what, brother, he's not going to look up there and say, the Lord's going to say, boy, I'm telling you, you really worked out good the other day, and I'm going to give you a reward. Nope. Nope, it's absolute hay. It's just hay. Sit and, and talk for hours about a ball game, about your hikes and your camping events and all your vacations and, and you're working on your yard and making sure I've got the prettiest yard in the community and I trim my bushes and everything. Oh, well, good for you. It will mean nothing at the judgment. Nothing. I'm not saying you should be a slob or never exercise, but it will profit you nothing. Let's look at stubble. Does anybody in here know the definition of stubble? Well, you better, because that's where about half y'all's life fits into. <laughs> so stubble, stubble, the definition of stubble, look it up, is when a man ain't shaved in two or three days and he got little whiskers. That's stubble. Shave it off. It, what is that good for? Stubble. Stubble. Now, they caught, when they cut the wheat, that little part still sticking out of the ground, that was called stubble. That ain't worth nothing. That's all the time you spend on your phone and texting and Facebook and playing, watching videos on the Internet that ain't got no spiritual value whatsoever. The devil is tricking you into wasting your life. And you're mad at me? Like it's my fault you're wasting your life? Listen, you think I'm being mean? You wait till you stand in front of him. And he said, what'd you do Monday? What'd you do Tuesday? What'd you do? Well, I watched Oprah and then I watched Ellen. I know she's gay, but I think she's funny. Tell him that. Tell him that. And he'll fly, brother. Whiskers. Your iPad, whiskers. Texting, shopping. All the time you spend primping. I mean, you can get, you ladies, you get, a, you get your razor and shave your eyebrows off and then draw you some on. Why do you do that? You already got some. Why do you do that? I mean, I ain't saying that's a sin, but it's whiskers. <laughs> the bearded lady I mean, you know, may show up there, I don't know. Sinning. You say, well, Brother Danny, what's going to happen to you? He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You'll walk in saying, Lord, I sure am ashamed. I don't know. Now what's he going to get in rewards? And I'm done. Beautiful rewards. There are five crowns mentioned in the Bible you could be a recipient of. You say, what do I want five crowns? I don't understand now, but I promise you there'll be a reason for it and you'll wish you did when it gets there. Number one, we'll name these off and I'm done. There is the crown of life. James chapter one and verse 12. This crown is given for enduring temptation and tribulation and is called by some the martyr's crown. He said, and he said, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. He did not say be faithful to death and I'll give you eternal life. You already got that when you get saved. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life which the Lord has promised them. See, uh, look here. He said a crown of life. He, uh, he, he changed the channel now here. Uh, he, he turned your head, see. Uh, every time you said no, when the girls wanted to go out and get drunk, you said no. When a guy at work hit on you and said, hey, how about me and you, me? No. Well, when some, every time you turned down temptation, every time you, you, every time you said no to the devil and everything in you was pulling and it was hard and your flesh 
just wanted to do something real bad and you said, by the grace of God, Jesus died for me. I can't do that. No. How are you getting somewhere when you get like that? You're getting somewhere when everything in you wants to do something wrong and you turn around and walk away from it for the glory of God. Number two, there's a crown of glory. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2, 3, and 4. Let the elders who feed the flock, who rule well, uh, be, you know, they'll get a crown of glory. This crown is for feeding the flock, to, uh, teaching, preaching, teaching Sunday school, getting you a new convert, teaching them the Bible, feeding people the Word of God, feeding people the Word of God. Tell them, every, ask, anytime you go somewhere with me, we're going to talk about the Lord, we're going to listen to preaching, we're going to listen, ask anybody that rides with me. Well, we're going to talk about the Lord, I'm going to try to feed you. I'm always trying to feed the kids, feed them. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm feeding the flock. I'm feeding you the word of God. A crown of glory. Number three, a crown of rejoicing. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 19 and 20. This is a soul winner's crown. He said, when we, when we are you not even ye in the present, what is our rejoicing or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye my converts, people that you've won to the Lord. The song says it like this. When we see the souls that we have helped to win, leading them to Jesus from the past of sin, with a shout of welcome, we'll all march in. Keep on the firing line. Everything you did to try to get somebody, listen, if I'm giving the invitation and you bow your head and say, Lord, please convict so-and-so, God, or if you grab your Bible and come down here and lead them to the Lord, that is a crown of rejoicing. The Lord will hold out, hang out one of these days on your head, buddy. Old Joe Parson will get it. He's already up there. He's the man that preached revival I got saved in. Uh, and every preacher, everybody that's ever won people to the Lord gets a crown of rejoicing. Number four is a crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, you know what Paul said? He said, I've finished my course, kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. You'll get this crown if you want Jesus to come back. Love his appearing. You talk about the Lord coming back around, some people say, oh, no, could not, don't talk like that. I was talking to a lady the other day, Joe, me and Brother Wayne, Joe, and uh, Woody from down in Florida, and she said, I want the Lord to come back. I'm ready yeah. for him right now. Sooner the better. I'd just love to see him today. There's your crown right there, sister. What's the last prayer in the Bible? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you people here this morning really would like to see the Lord come today and just get this thing over with? I would. I mean that. I mean, you say, oh, you're talking tough, brother. I dread this. What I've been talking to you this morning, I dread it. I dread it, buddy. But I'm, I'm trying, if we get this over with, buddy, it's all over but the shout. And I'm telling you, son, I, the best thing could happen for a child of God would be for Jesus to come back today. You say, well, I got some stuff I'd like to do better than heaven. Please tell me about it. Crown of righteousness into the beautiful city. Come, Lord, come. You want him to come, he'll give you a crown. Five, lastly, is an incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, 6, and 7. It says, by for running the race, it's for running the race and not getting tangled up in this world. Like a runner, not getting off track. I have, so when I got saved, the Lord put me on my, my lane. Introduce him. In lane 200,946, Nebo, North Carolina, Danny Castle, go. And I took off running. I've been running since I was eight. 18 years old in the race. Man, I've been tripped. I fell and hit my face, went in the mud. The devil's tripped me, lights me. But by the grace of God, I'm still running my track this morning. And I intend to, by the help of the Lord, finish and cross the finish line. I'd love for the Lord to say, well done, Danny. Here's an incorruptible crown. And they do it for a corruptible crown. They did it back then for a laurel leaf around their head or some kind of statue or something. But we an incorruptible. Amen. I mean, brother, we're not getting off track. You're not going to come to this church and we're not going to become an environmentalist advocate and green peace, advancement of the world peace, but a nonsense junk like that right there. Listen, brother, I'll tell you what God thinks about global warming. He's going to burn the whole thing up on these days. I'm talking about Smokey Bear and the birds and, there and every bit of it, brother, and make a brand new and we're in dwelleth righteousness. We'll get an incorruptible crown for staying the course. Stay in where we're supposed to be. By the grace of God, I'm going to stay straight on the course that God gave me to run in. You got to watch some of these preachers. You don't know if they're a politician or a money-grabbing 
crook or what they are. Amen. They don't preach that. Amen. People come up that's never heard of us and will shake our hands and hug our necks and say, I got saved in South America yes, in sir. 2005 and a missionary said, your church sent him there and you gave money to and I want to hug your neck. I said a man one time, a beggar went out who was sent out by an emperor and this beggar went out and he was begging for food and help and he asked this guy, he said, can you help me? And the guy said, here, and give him a grain of rice. He said, is that all you're going to give me? I'm starving. And the guy said, all right. And he gave him another grain of rice. And he left. But long after that, the emperor had a big gathering. And that man was all called in. And the emperor said, I have so much wealth. I'm going to distribute my wealth among all the people. And he called that man up here. And he gave him a little piece of gold the size of a piece of rice. And that man says, is that all you're going to give me? He said, oh, we'll give you another one. A little piece of gold. Father. That's all you get. That's all you sent ahead. That's all you done. And that's what you get. Man, that's scary, y'all. I stand before y'all this morning. Y'all come get a song, Brother Jason. Crystal, y'all come. I stand in front of y'all this morning asking you to pray for me. I don't want to stand empty-handed at that day. Let's stand by our head for prayer, please. Every head bowed, never eye closed. I wonder how many are here this morning. Say, preacher, man, I got to do better. Preacher, 80% of my life is going to go up in smoke. Be burned up. But I'm going to come, I can do the rest. I can't, I can't go back and undo yesterday. But I can live for the Lord today. And I'm going to start living for the Lord today. Why don't you come today? See, come on right now. Father, help us now, right now, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Help us, Lord. Amen. Y'all go ahead. Amen. Come on, come on. Come on. I wish that I You can't go back and turn back time. I tell you what you can do. I tell you what you can do. You can live today. You can do something for God today. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Come on, son. Come on, daddy. Come on, mom. Husbands and wives. Let's send this all to this morning. I want to get ready to meet the Lord one day. I want to get ready to meet the Lord. How about it, friend? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Say, here I am. Use me, Lord. Use your words to sing and say. Amen. Let me love. Let me live. Let me give myself away. Lord, you've done all this for me. What have I done for you? What have I done for you, Lord? All I have is yours complete. Come on. Let my life. I can live for the Lord today. Amen. There are so many things I wish I could Oh, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back and undo a lot of things. But you can't. You can't. I'll tell you what you can do. You can start all over. You can start over right here today. Say, Lord, I'm starting to brand you. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. Hallelujah. Come on now, say. So here I am. Use me, Lord. Give me words to sing and say. Let me love. Let me live. Let me give myself away. Use my hands. Use 
song this morning. I hope that you'll make a brand new start this morning. You can't go back and undo yesterday and last week. Well, I wish you could. Man, there's a lot of stuff I'd do different if I could. But you can't. But you can do right now. You can serve God now. You can live for the Lord today. You can go home this evening. Make a new, fresh start today. I tell you, I, something's on my heart real heavy, and I can't get it off, y'all. Come on, brother. And I don't ever... I know, I know it's a little bit late, but you'll bear with me just a couple of minutes. Um, I want us to, uh, Jeremy, get them off from plates, and I want us to help Miss Sandy, Miss Sandy Bowling. They've been having to go back and forth to the, to the, to the treatments. Junior's been having to miss work to stay with her, and uh, I'm telling you, they, they hadn't asked for it. They're the type of people that would never ask. They wouldn't. But. Uh, I want you to get something out. Let's give them something good today. Man, here it is, Christmas time, and they're having to take cancer treatments. And it couldn't be at a worse time. And Sandy loves our church. Yes, she, she's a bus captain. She's uh, Brother Junior, they love our church. Amen. And they're faithful to church. It's not, not somebody that's just going to take it and waste it. They need our help right now. If you want to write a check, just write to the church, and we'll write one to them. Anything you could do to help them. Is, well, I understand it's Christmas time. Money's tight. I know that. But uh, I'm, I'm going to give them something. I brought it uh, from the house this morning. I thought, well, maybe I won't. It just wouldn't get off my mind. It wouldn't get off my mind. So let's do it this morning, okay? Hey, Amen. Here you go, Jeff. Everybody, just go ahead and pass them while they finish the song. Go ahead. I've not always, I've not always been faithful, but Hey, man. Hey, man. Do something for them like you would want if it's the other way around. Grab a hold of his hand. Let him grab a hold of your hand. Lord, I can't do this by myself. You're going to have to help me, Lord. He'll help you. He'll help you. you. Turn loose. Just turn loose. Let God help you. this evening. Uh, if you want to get this message, it'll be on the internet for the week's over probably and get all those scriptures. I spit out a lot of doctrine on y'all this morning. I mean, it's as a, as a heavy dose. That's about a four